Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I think we've got a few people still signing on, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Melanie Loisum, co-chair of the Maine Climate Council and commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, joined today by my illustrious co-chair, Hannah Pingree, and her awesome staff from the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future. Um, today, we are going to continue some of the conversations and updates that we've been providing to the council over the course of the summer. Um, just to take a step back, a reminder that when we'd started the Climate Council, one of the things that we had emphasized was that we wanted to focus on taking action and getting some real work done to address climate change in Maine. And we've had some tremendous funding opportunities that have come from the federal government uh, that have been leveraged by Governor Mills through the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan. And we are really excited to give you updates about some of the tremendous work that's been happening, uh, implementing the recommendations of the plan. Um, we are going to do a fair bit of talking at you this morning, but we will have some time for discussion later on. Uh, we do want to hear some feedback from you about how the climate conference went. Um, Cassie, I don't know if you want to pull up the slide deck and just get us to the agenda slide to get us started. Thanks. Uh, so we're going to start with some updates on our Community Resilience Partnership Program. Then we're going to be hearing from the co-chairs of several of our working groups regarding buildings, transportation, energy, natural and working lands, as well as an update on water and wastewater infrastructure funding. Uh, we're going to hear about the Climate Corps. And then, like I said, we want to get some feedback from you on the conference. Um, and then talk to you about next steps for our next meeting that will be coming in December. So again, some talking at you today, some discussion, and then for our next meeting, we really wanna plan on starting to dig into the next planning cycle. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you Melanie, thank you. and good to see you all this morning. It's, um, hope everyone had a great summer. Uh, Commissioner Van Note reminded me it's not over. It's a it's another beautiful day in Maine. Um, and again, as Melanie said, we have an action-packed agenda of uh, what I would say is a lot of exciting updates, really heavy lifting happening across state government, across communities, um, in businesses. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing some of that good news. Again, there's going to be a fair amount of talking at you, but we're, again, appreciative of all the folks who are here on the Climate Council and the folks tuning in. So uh, we're going to have a quick update on the Community Resilience Partnership. You heard a little bit about that um, this past spring at our last meeting, but we've had some exciting progress. Uh, Brian Ambrett on our GoPIF team, a uh, senior resilience uh, staffer who works closely with Sarah Kern, um, has been traveling the state, has been working with our amazing staff and community partners. So um, I think this is this uh, project is really just brings together a lot of the components of what Maine Won't Wait is all about. So I will pass it off to Brian for uh, an update. Great, thanks Hannah. Good morning everybody and Cassie, there we go. Um, so just a quick reminder, the Community Resilience Partnership was launched by Governor Mills on the first anniversary of the Maine Won't Wait Climate Action Plan. So uh, last December, it's funded with $4.7 million from the biennial state budget. And its purpose is to provide grants and technical assistance to help communities and tribes in Maine reduce their emissions, transition to clean energy, and improve their resilience to climate impacts. Um, the update that I gave you last spring was this map on the left showing uh, the 75 communities that are uh, receiving some kind of assistance from the program currently. Uh, the dots there in green are communities that received grants last spring and the dots in yellow are the communities that are receiving technical assistance to get started uh, in the partnership and set their early priorities. In that first round, uh, 29 communities received a combined $1.2 million for energy and resilience projects, and then 12 service provider organizations are helping another 46 communities get started. Um, over the summer, GOPIF and GEO staff started making site visits to these grantee communities. Uh, we made stops in Rockland, Biddeford, Norway, and Machias. And it's been a really great opportunity for us to meet the project teams in each of these communities, um, including their local and state elected leaders. 
And in several cases, actually see the project sites and understand how the grants are funding uh, the work that's going on on the ground and how that helps build either resilience or clean energy and emissions reductions in those communities. We heard from the leaders and others there that the partnership is really making space in those communities for new conversations about vulnerable infrastructure and residents, energy use and cost savings, and the benefits of proactive planning and being ready for uh, being ready as a community and as a government for state and federal infrastructure opportunities and funding opportunities. Cassie, you can go to the next slide. In the early summer, we announced the start of our second grant round. Uh, communities are required to officially enroll in the partnership in order to be eligible for grants. Uh, we currently have 56 communities fully enrolled uh, and it's happening quickly. We're getting them at five or six a day at this point ahead of the next grant deadline. Uh, another 25 communities are working with service providers to enroll either for this grant deadline coming up uh, very shortly or for the next grant opportunity, which will happen in early next year. Uh, we're currently reviewing applications right now for the service provider grants. And these are the grants that will um, provide technical assistance to communities to help them get enrolled and prioritize their early actions. And then we have a grant deadline rapidly approaching for the community action grant less than a week away on September 20th. Uh, we anticipate making public announcements about the results of both of these grants probably in November. And then, as I said, a third grant round will open in the first part of next year. So that's the quick update, Hannah, and I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Brian. And um, again, it's been a lot of heavy lifting, but I would say we have many partners uh, across the state helping with this program. And this program is meant to work with programs at DOT, uh, Efficiency Maine, and others. So it's just Super exciting to see communities engaging and you all live in communities. So if you have a community, you should check our website at some point and see if your community has uh, engaged in these conversations because we are um, working hard to get as many communities across the state engaged, especially those towns who might benefit from both technical assistance and grant funds. So um, thank you, Brian, uh, really exciting. Um, that is a good segue to uh, Michael Stoddard, who is um, both the co-chair of the uh, buildings, Infrastructure, and Housing Working Group, as well as the head of Efficiency Main Trust. Um, I will say that uh, the work that's been possible because of a variety of um, initiatives that Efficiency Main has put forward, the legislature, um, the main jobs and recovery plan, there's just a lot happening. And it is, I think, one of the most exciting areas of uh, climate action where we're seeing Maine won't wait um, really happening before our eyes. And people in Maine are engaging, communities are engaging. Um, businesses, schools, and others. So I'll let Michael um, take it from there, but just really grateful for the work of Efficiency Main Trust and their staff, but obviously all the other contractors and others who are engaged to really get the work done. So pass it off to you, Michael. Thanks, Hannah. Um, why don't you go to the next slide, please, Cassie? Thanks. Um, so the first recommendation in the list of recommendations in the Climate Action Plan was focusing on our heating and cooling systems that we have in all our homes and our businesses. Um, and that would extend a little bit also to appliances. Um, there's opportunities with all of these types of equipment to make them more efficient and also to shift to using energy supplies that are cleaner and have lower carbon emissions. Uh, so in Maine, that, as we all know, uh, that means in a lot of cases, shifting to heat pump technology because it is more efficient uh, consumption of the energy and it uses electricity instead of the alternatives, which might be um, propane or oil uh, or biomass, um, each of which has a higher carbon footprint than the electricity that we make. So why don't we go to the next slide and see how we're doing on that transition. Um, you know, we've been running programs through Efficiency Maine to uh, provide incentives for people to purchase heat pumps since about 2013. Uh, but you can see starting around 2018, 2019, it started to accelerate. And then in 2021, it really took off. Um, that was due to a, a whole bunch of factors, but I think not the least of which was the passage of legislation setting the new target of 100,000 heat pumps over five years. And 
giving efficiency main a little bit more free reign to um, increase our incentives and also our marketing and support of these. So we had more resources to do that. Um, the graph that I had at my fingertips only went through 2021, but we've just recently started to get preliminary data on our completed 2022 fiscal year that ended June 30. And as you can see uh, in the margin on the right there, we got to about 29,000 units if you add in the 500 or so from main housing, which were for low income. Um, we also have low income programs. And so we were able to get about a thousand out to low income homes. And then, you know, um, just shy of 25,000 in homes and another 3,000, almost 3,100 in commercial settings. So really good uh, continued sustained demand for this critically important piece of technology that uh, over time we need to shift to to meet our carbon reduction targets. Um, you know, it would be nice to see the the pace of acceleration greater than what we were able to achieve last year. On the other hand, um, we had a pandemic and um, that makes all these kinds of transactions quite a bit more challenging. So uh, kudos to the contractor community that really kept at it and to the homeowners who found ways when it was safe to have people come work on their homes. That was not an insignificant ask of everybody and yet they they did um, they did do it. And so it's great and I'm hopeful that as I'll talk about in a minute, there's some new things we're gonna be able to introduce that I think will uh, continue to accelerate the rate of the transition. Let's go to the next slide. I don't want to forget that um, we don't only use heat for heating the spaces that we live and work in. We also use it for water. Uh, we, we heat up water for what's called domestic hot water um, for showers and doing the dishes and running restaurants and hotels and all all the ways that you use hot water. It's very important. It uses a lot of energy. In the home, it typically uses as much as 25% of the electricity that's consumed in a home if they use a, uh, the standard re electric resistance hot water heater. The heat pump hot waters, hot water heaters, excuse me, are twice as efficient as the old electric resistance. Uh, so they can save people um, you know, uh, significantly on the on the cost of running hot water systems. Um, you can see we were on a terrific trajectory over the last four years. Last year slowed down a little bit. It was really uh, a combination of the um, Delta and then Omicron variants of the of the virus kind of spooking people about doing work in their homes. And then also supply chain issues started to started to hit here. There's a little bit more material going on inside one of these water heaters and it has cost the price to go up a bit. Um, and that's gonna continue to be a challenge. Next slide, please. Um, there are some new things that we're excited about going on in Maine and at Efficiency Maine. Thanks to the funding that Hannah mentioned from the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan, uh, we have really generous new budgets to focus on specific sectors. So hospitality, schools, municipalities, and congregate housing are all going to be targets of our use of the MJRP funds. You can see the dollar amounts there, but it's really significant funding. And in all those cases, we are emphasizing first and foremost looking at heating systems that are old and inefficient and ready to be switched over to high efficiency heat pumps. The heat pumps, um, one of the things I've been reporting on in the last year is that the manufacturers are coming up with more and more models and more and more configurations so they can use them in more and more applications. And that's really exciting. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing people put them in their hotels and their um, hotels and motels in more and more school buildings, town offices, um, and, and congregate housing. Uh, another thing we did is we ran a couple of pilot projects to demonstrate the functionality of heat pumps when they are the only heating system in your home, Hannah Pingree. And so we wanted to, we knew that they worked, we had heard anecdotally, but we wanted to track it um, and, and more scientifically uh, demonstrate that it was working. And so we ran them through a couple of winters in homes that had nothing but heat pumps, or in some cases, they 
ran primarily heat pumps and then would occasionally use some form of backup on the uh, coldest days when it was below minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, uh, you know, it was great. It was great results showing that these homes were all stayed comfortable and ran their heat pumps all winter long, 24 um, seven. Perhaps even more exciting than that was a pilot we ran on mobile homes where we switched out the uh, natural gas or propane furnaces in the Miller furnace closets and popped in a heat pump replacement that fed through the existing ductwork in the mobile homes. And uh, people may recall it was super cold in January and these heat pumps performed fantastically. Everyone reported being warm uh, through the entire month of January, even though it, we got really, really cold temperatures. Next slide, please. So a uh, couple other things. Um, I just mentioned those two studies. Um, there's, there's work going on at the PUC to look at um, reviewing the rates and sort of rationalizing the electric utilities rates so that they are fair and, uh, and don't disadvantage uh, people who are switching to heat pumps. And there seems to be uh, movement in that direction. So we're optimistic about that. And then of course, we are um, in the process of finalizing rules for commercial PACE loans that we will offer through the Efficiency Main Green Bank coming up, I think no later than the end of this calendar year. And for, for commercial customers, that will give them a way to tackle bigger projects like a whole building uh, uh, switch over to a heat pump system. Next slide, please. And last but not least, um, really exciting news out of the recently passed federal legislation. Um, there are targeted rebates for electrification, which is very explicitly about heat pumps. Mains, we estimate that Maine's formulaic share of that fund will be about $38 million and another $38 million for something called the homes rebates, which are largely for weatherization, but can also be used for heating systems. Um, there are uh, expanded and extended tax credits, which are gonna make it uh, explicitly eligible uh, for heat pump retrofits. Uh, and they've increased the amounts that people will be able to take advantage of for tax credits. New construction for homes will also be eligible for a tax credit. Uh, this includes multifamily buildings. And then finally, there's the establishment of a funding stream for green banks around the country, of which we are one. And uh, I, there again, there are some very attractive opportunities and funding for uh, projects on low-income homes in, in disadvantaged communities. Let's go to the next one. So I think that's about it for the heat pumps. Quickly, um, uh, the other major element of the building's work group's recommendations pertained to weatherization, tightening up the building so we don't need to use so much energy to keep them warm or cool or comfortable. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thanks, Cassie. So uh, top priority is for low and moderate income Mainers. Um, we used another chunk of the funds from the MJRP, which was $25 million to, uh, to advance weatherization in low and moderate income homes. Uh, that has taken off really nicely. You can see the early results. We have increased the rate of weatherizations in low income homes by 600%. Uh, the size of the project has doubled since we launched this. And uh, most importantly, I think, the workforce, which was totally reeling from the effects of COVID and people basically shutting down their homes to having contractors come in, um, they've, they've been able to hire back workers and even hire them at higher wages. And so we're starting to see some really good workforce capacity growth there, and that's critical. Uh, we're forecasting just through the Efficiency Maine program for low income weatherization, somewhere between 350 and 400 units completed this year. Next slide, please. Um, we're not the only ones that are promoting weatherization for low income. Maine Housing also runs programs. They use the Department of Energy's weatherization program funds, and then they also use HUD's LIHEAP funds and a little portion of that gets set aside for weatherization. And you can see here the numbers from 2021, which were the last full year of data that I had. But I think we can expect that 2022 will be similar. 
Next slide, please. Um, and I don't want to leave out other sectors of the economy. We've been talking about residential mostly, but it's also the case that we run programs for industrial um, manufacturers in the state of Maine. I didn't have, it's not that exciting to talk about the different programs because they, they are all custom projects. So people, um, the industrials come to us with custom project proposals and we review them and work with them to put those in place. The most important thing here is that we have enough budget. And as you can see here, we have very significant budgetary commitments over the next three years. So I think that is gonna stand us in very good stead to keep working with them. Next slide, please. I uh, didn't wanna leave out some exciting new developments on demand management, which are things that Efficiency Maine uh, does and the state can do on the customer side of the meter. So this is not power plants, this is not wind and solar and hydro and, and other kinds of renewables. This is stuff that the customers can do on their side of the, uh, what we call on their side of the meter, behind the meter. Next slide, please. And one of the things we can do is adjust how people are using their energy and when they are using their energy so that we don't put too much strain on the grid because as we put more and more of our heating and our transportation shifted over to electricity, we're obviously going to put a lot of demand on the grid. And if we all do that simultaneously, um, you can see that bad things can happen. So we have to be more sophisticated about how we manage our use of the grid. And that includes the timing of when we are using it. Uh, so there are things you can do in this day of d digitization um, where you can ramp things up and down and you can do that remotely and you can do that with automation. So we've uh, one thing we've done is we've launched a new demand response initiative um, we launched it in the spring. It's already been called on five times over the course of the summer during various heat waves. And um, that's nice that Maine now has that tool in the toolbox to manage uh, demand during peak events. Uh, we've launched a $5 million battery project focusing primarily on battery applications in critical care facilities, but recently um, we've expanded that to be eligible for other commercial facilities. So it's gonna be nice to start getting more battery uh, experience and, and battery resources in the ground in Maine. Um, the non-wires alternative process, this is very wonky, but it is an intriguing uh, opportunity that I think we will see more of in Maine, but there is a process in place now in Maine where when the utilities wanna build new transmission and distribution uh, physical plant, they need to first go through a, a process to compare with other alternative approaches to solving the grid problems in that particular circuit. And if it can be done more cost effectively with alternatives such as distributed energy, distributed renewables, energy efficiency, batteries, then the cheaper solution gets the call and, and should be developed. And so we had one of those situations in Brunswick Topsom on a circuit there and the PUC recently approved that. And over the next couple of years, Efficiency Maine will be developing a, a battery, a, a series of batteries and efficiency projects that will meet that demand. Uh, finally, there's a, uh, there's a cool pilot project going on that got funded from the U.S. Department of Energy to do more of what I was just describing and using Maine as a um, uh, couple of communities in Maine as um, pilot project areas for that. I think that's it. Next slide. Yes, I'm out. Hey. Thank you, Michael. That was great. I think it's a... Um illustration of just how much is going on across all of the different sectors and you know how much we're doing now already to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel combustion, which is the major contributor to greenhouse gases in Maine. So that all of these programs are going to be really critically important to help us do those greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, and I, just as a reminder, as we all know, transportation sector is the uh, leading source of greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel combustion. And so next, we're going to hear updates from Commissioner Van Note and Joyce Taylor from Department of Transportation. Thanks, Melanie, and th thanks to everyone uh, in the climate change community here. Um, couldn't do this with all the partners at GOPIF and DP and uh, everyone. So uh, it's a real team effort. Um, I'm just going to do a couple slides and then hand it off to my uh, very able uh, chief engineer, Joyce Taylor, who's uh, 
as you know, been uh, on point on a lot of these uh, climate change efforts. Uh, the first is right out of the gate. Um, before we even had all the, the plan, there was a challenge to lead by example. And um, DOT was presented with an opportunity uh, to do some solar right here in the Augusta area. Uh, let me dispel one rumor right out of the gate. We did not cut the trees out on the interstate to install solar. That's not what happened. Um, I call this our uh, lemonade solar array because what happened is our maintenance staff for, for reasons of uh, safety, you know, wildlife, uh, less salt uses, more sun on the road, all those kinds of things, was uh, cutting trees. And um, some people thought they got a little overzealous in the inside of the, uh, in the, inside of the uh, rotor um, ramps. And uh, we ended up with a very big flat area that was publicly owned. And uh, honestly, it was, um, my idea because I was going home at night and you know right at sunset and in, in uh, the late fall one time and the sun was just blazing right in my eyes as I hit it south and um, so solar and we looked into it and lo and behold um, it was a good fit for um, the CMP connections and other things so we are have proceeded and are now under construction. We started this years ago. There were a lot of uh, a lot of work involved uh, with working with CMP, as has been widely reported. But there are exit 109, uh, 112, and the Augusta Airport. Um, they are under construction now. Um, the uh, the amount of energy we'll generate. I'm happy to report the 8.5 is just a subset. It's more like 15 million megawatts. Um, which will um, offset more than 2,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions. And the savings there is listed at the low end, uh, net present value savings of 7.2 million, depending on what the PO, PUC, annual PUC tariff rates are. But that could go up north of 13 million, depending on what those rates are. So um, it really is a win-win uh, for both uh, the environment uh, and for the state budget. Um, long term. Um, and yes, there's no other than some uh, property costs, very low value, and a lot of staff time. Thank you, David Gardner. Um, the uh, no upfront costs. And uh, not only that, uh, we will be planting pollinators all the way around. So we will help with the uh, um, that critical need in the environment too. So there's one where you just uh, uh, turn a lemon into some lemonade there. Maybe you cut some trees, but uh, we can still help the environment. We also have been leading with uh, EVs and EV charging uh, um, right here at the HQ office right here in Augusta and all five regional offices across the state. Um, and we have uh, started acquiring electric vehicles. And we got our first Ford Lightning recently. So we'll, and no, I'm not driving it, um, but uh, that, that will be um, exciting for the person who gets to use that. Next, next slide, please. Uh, also, uh, we, DOT does use uh, a lot of diesel. Uh, there's no question in, in both for running our fleet and um, also heating our uh, maintenance facility. Um, and we had already had a relationship with biodiesel uh, to be used for heat and running the vehicles. And we have increased that. Um, that's actually more of a supply issue. At first, there was a concern about it being stored in cold temperatures, but uh, we've kind of get that under control. So now it's like, how much can we get? And uh, there's another way we've been able to reduce emissions. And uh, we also are looking to uh, install heat pumps uh, every place we can um, as you know facilities get updated. Uh, we're obviously not putting in a nice big old diesel um, type heater. So that's just some overview of leading by example. Uh, and uh, obviously there's a lot, lot more going on. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to DOT's chief engineer and our climate guru, uh, in DOT, Joyce Taylor. Thanks, Bruce. 
Um, next slide, please, Cassie. So a lot has been going on. Um, we've been working with really um, DEP, GOPIF, especially Efficiency Main Trust, and getting our plans together um, for electric vehicle charging. We had something up on our website um, earlier this summer to talk about the federal funds that came in the BIL um, Act from the feds. Uh, we, Maine will be receiving in formula funds about $19 million over five years. And then we have MJRP funds, um, $8 million, which we plan to work with Efficiency Maine on. Um, there's a map showing where you can see um, with the red, you know, we have some level three or the fast chargers that are scheduled to be built. We have some others um, that you can see that exist today, but there's big swaths of the state that don't have any um, level three charging. And I think it's, you know, our feeling um, and really the Nature Conservancy had done a really nice focus group on this topic. And one of the things that came out is the number one uh, stumbling block to getting people to buy EVs was the range anxiety. And so even if someone only goes to, you know, Madawaska once every three years, they want to know they can take their car. So we are using the MJRP money and have just announced um, our intent to fund level three chargers in Aroostook County in Washington County. We're also using some of that money um, with Efficiency Maine for level two chargers. In particular, there's an interest in trying to get municipalities, uh, libraries to apply. So that's up on their website right now. And it's really more like a rebate program that you can look at the details, um, but we're hoping to get more level twos out that the vast majority of people can probably charge with level twos. Level threes give them a comfort level. Um, so we're anxiously awaiting for our um, NEVI plan, that's the federal plan, to get approved. Um, we did propose a phased approach. Um, the rules with the federal government is that we had to build out all of our alternative fuel corridors first with the fast chargers with this money. Um, and we really would not have been able to go very far if we had done that. So we came up with a system where we would do the full build out, the four plugs, 150 kilowatts a piece, where there's higher traffic, but when there's there's less traffic, two plugs and a shared 150 kilowatts, and then there's something in between. So we're waiting to see if that gets approved. Um, Maine is on the same uh, page as many other rural states in, in asking for this kind of approach. But we're pretty excited. I think we're gonna be able to really get everybody um, to a place where there's a fast charger within 50 miles um, of each other on a public road system that Maine DOT owns. And so that's exciting. So you can go to the next slide. Um, we also um, worked with uh, a number of agencies, including NEMA, DEP, DHHS, GOPIF, and we um, have uh, announced the winners of the Maine Infrastructure Adaptation Fund. And it really was targeted very specifically um, in the federal legislation for um, protecting wastewater, uh, drinking water systems, as well as stormwater. And so we have a pretty good range around the state. Um, I would give uh, DEP some kudos. They've been funding uh, climate plans for sewer systems. And I would say the wastewater systems and a lot of those folks were prepared uh, to apply for construction funding because they've already done a climate plan. So I think that was, that was great. Um, hoping to get contracts signed um, probably early next month. Um, Taylor, Taylor Lebrecht, who's on this call, is negotiating with the communities to get these signed. So next slide. Um, some other things, um, and, and Commissioner, um, I'll have to put the nickel in the jar because I just called him Commissioner, but feel free to, to pitch in on this. Um, but there is new formula funding coming to DOT in, in terms of EV charging, which I just talked about, a protect fund, a carbon reduction fund, um, all kinds of discretionary grant opportunities. I, I don't know if you want to pitch in on this, this is, this is, oh, this is his topic, let me tell you, because um, we are scouring, scouring the bill um, to get as much money as we can for the state and looking, um, you know, we've, we've actually kicked off 
several sea level rise projects um, with engineering to try to take advantage of some of this money as well as other things. Um, the department's committed on all of these projects to uh, make areas more bikeable, walkable, um, as well as opening up culverts, bridges um, for that storm passage or fish passage. So um, we're pretty excited about all of this opportunity. Next uh, the slide. Only yeah, the only ahead. thing I'd add, Joyce, is that, um, well, just Friday, we got another notice of award of 77 million. Uh, some of this is going, not all climate related. Some of it is kind of the meat and potatoes, highway and bridge stuff. Um, but uh, the bottom line is there is an opportunity through discretionary grants to potentially double our annual federal funding uh, through discretionary grant programs. Um, the, but we don't know, they're competitive. You wait to see, you put an application, see if you win. Uh, but if we do, uh, the limit may end up being, um, of course, you always have to find state match for those, for those funds. So um, it's just a very big deal. It's potentially transformative. Uh, after we get a full year under our belt, we'd be better in a better position to predict just how much um, this uh, could be but it, uh, it appears to be a uh, potential game changer. So uh, we'll keep working at the applications, keep working with state policymakers to make sure we can match them and uh, just keep on rolling and keep on, keep on scouring. They, they basically <laughs> call me like a hound dog rooting around in, in bills and, and we will continue to root around. So thank you, Joyce. Yeah, okay, next slide. So transportation continues here. Um, a lot of opportunity for electric school buses through the US EPA grant program. There's 5 billion nationwide available. Um, we have 60 schools in Maine that have applied in a recent round, which is very exciting. And Jess Scott, whose email is here, who works for Hannah, has been really running this effort. So um, give her a call or send her an email, or if you have my email, I'll connect you or Hannah's, uh, but we'll connect you. But she is working real hard to um, make sure everybody who wants to puts an application in. Um, we have four electric transit buses in use in the state right now. And then um, Biddeford Saco Old Orchard Beach has ordered another two. I'm happy to report that in spite of um, some nervousness, they seem to be working right now um, during the summer months uh, quite well. So we're very happy about that. And DOT is just getting to the end of a process where um, we have done transit bus electrification plans through a consultant with um, about eight transit organizations in the state. And basically I would call this a medium level look where the consultants going in, they're looking at where's their power supply, where do they park their buses at night? What are their routes? And it's literally recommending, okay, I think like tomorrow you could go order two buses and they could be used tomorrow in these locations, but you need to get a power supply um, that's this big and you need to move, um, move the buses over here to park and this is what you need. So they'll be able to really, I think, also look harder at federal grant opportunities because now they know what they're going to need to do um, to do electrification. So. We also have some best practices on transit electrification we just received that we um, need to release. And so you'll be seeing some of that stuff coming from us. Um, next slide. Okay, um, this is exciting. We have been working really hard on active transportation, livable communities. Um, Bruce has really been pushing a village program where we're getting partnerships with a number of villages to look at, you know, reimagining what their village looks like for economic um, development, as well as, you know, just safer walking and biking. We have a new policy about to come out that we've written and uh, would expect comments on, on complete streets. We're actually, um, I haven't even asked him, but I expect that Bruce will kick this off for us, but we're going to do some internal, what I call philosophy training um, in terms of kind of what our expectations are from our project managers and designers when they're working um, on capital projects. And, you know, we can't be everything to everyone all the time. Money is 
you know, still um, not easy uh, considering all the miles we have. Um, but we want to really listen to people and try to figure out, you know, uh, how we can help them feel safer. We helped participate in the Portland Bike Share program that launched August 15th. Um, we're very excited about that. I was in Portland on the trail and a couple people went pedaling by on the bike. So that was kind of exciting to see. Um, part of that is we are working with them to try to get some of these hubs at the Portland Housing Authority locations um, so that it's there's an equitable use. Um, we've also been working on a couple e-bike pilot programs. Um, one is to get a lending library through the state library system um, so that people can try them. Um, another is to buy some bikes and be able to um, bring them to events, let people have a chance to ride them. Um, if you haven't been on an e-bike, it really is a game changer for people with, um, you know, who maybe don't feel comfortable riding a bike anymore. Um, people with um, who don't have a license, people who can't afford a car, um, it can definitely get you further than you can get typically on a regular bike. And we're also working um, uh, with a sister agency on a, a program where um, we can get a pilot program similar to Vermont and Colorado where we can get people back to work with e-bikes. So that's something we're working on. And next slide. So um, I'm covering broadband. Um, the main connectivity authority was formed um, to bring broadband to our state. I will say uh, we've been lending the authority, um, one of our folks part-time helping uh, liaison between um, transportation and broadband, because most likely they will want to use some of our right-of-way. Um, they are also applying for discretionary grants like MAD, and they um, are working very hard to connect folks um, by the end of 2024, which is a very ambitious goal. So um, I, I applaud them for that. Um, they also have a jumpstart connectivity pilot and they're picking communities for that. So next slide. I think this is my last one. So as part of the VIL, there is all kinds of money um, for state, states with sea run um, fish to be able to get culvert money. Um, and we have lots of culverts in Maine and we have lots of sea run fish. So um, we are working with the Nature Conservancy and have asked them to help collaborate um, and get locations from resource agencies, NGOs, places where other folks you know, wanna see us open up a culvert to get bigger for fish passage, as well as, um, as overlaying the, the ones that we want to fix. So it's something we're working with. We've been working with DMR, IFNW, and lots of people. Um, we're just waiting for the notice of funding opportunity to come up. Um, this money really was probably um, came about because of Washington and Oregon and, and the work that they're doing out there on fish passage. But um, luckily, Maine is one of the uh, few states right now that uh, um, can apply for this money. It may loosen up. We don't know. And other states may be able to get in. But we're spending a lot of time on this one. Um, and DEP also, their grant uh, program is also open. And we work with them as well. So uh, spending a lot of effort on this. <laughs> so we want to take advantage um, to the best extent we can. And it's it's a good thing for DOT. You know, I think those of you have heard me before, you know, it's a win-win because, you know, I, I just drove from Caribou to Bangor today and driving rainstorms that were just, you know, you barely see kind of storms where that's the kind of storm we get all kinds of rain and we lose we lose a culvert because it's undersized. And so um, it's, it's a great thing for us to be able to upsize culverts for drainage purposes, much less fish passage. So I think I am done. Thanks, Joyce. Um, next, I'm going to briefly go over the water and wastewater investments. Um, as I think you've all heard before, we've seen a historic amount of funding being committed uh, to this critical infrastructure and are leveraging that here in Maine. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law has provided over $390 million to be spent over a five-year period uh, on water and wastewater infrastructure. 
uh, for the 2022 round, we've already distributed $68 million. So that's for drinking water and wastewater and approximately 1 million for infrastructure resilience. So those are uh, dollars that have already been committed to communities across the state. The next round of funding for 2023 under the revolving loan programs from both DEP and DHHS will get announced in January. So communities will be able to submit applications for those in the early part of 2023 and have that funding committed. Uh, this federal funding involves a lot more grant money and principal forgiveness for loans than it ever has in the past, which is particularly important for many of our disadvantaged communities. Um, we are now able to provide funding to communities that never before had been able to get their grant applications together or to be able to qualify for some of these grant opportunities. So this is really a game changer for being able to make investments in infrastructure in, in Maine in a way that we just have not been able to pull off in the past. Also through the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan, we've invested $20 million in the Infrastructure Adaptation Fund. That's going for projects for stormwater, drinking water, wastewater, and really to focus on those areas where it's not necessarily the traditional kind of infrastructure investments that we funded for drinking water and wastewater, these are other kinds of projects where we, as Joyce was just discussing, where we're seeing significant impacts as a result of climate change. And now we're going to have the funding that we're able to bring to bear to help those communities be more resilient to those impacts. And with that, I'll hand it back to Hannah. Great, thank you, Melanie. And well, um, well said, and honestly reflecting on, I was, I was looking at my trusty climate plan here, uh, which hopefully you all have on your desks, but you know, through Michael's presentation and the Commissioner Van Note and Joyce's and your comments, Melanie, I mean, it really is remarkable, um, the, the not just sort of pilot phase of let's see if we can try to start something in this arena, but the absolute significant investments and progress being made in every portion of the climate plan from uh, uh, public transportation to heat pump deployment to resilient infrastructure to EV charging. So some of it is at the beginning stages, some of it is uh, really underway, um, like our heat pump program, but I just would say it's just, that was a, a, a lot of information coming at people, sort of different big chunks. But again, refer back to your trusty climate plan. It really is incredible to see in each of the categories of strategy, um, just very um, significant work underway. Uh, so with that, um, I believe Dan Burgess, uh, the director of the governor's energy office, um, is with us. He, I believe, is on the road to Rumford, um, so he's calling in. Um, Dan uh, has uh, been working with his team and uh, lots of folks uh, on these Zoom screens on um, efforts to both uh, ensure clean energy is part of our mix to electrify all the things we've been talking about, but also grow the clean energy jobs. And actually, it was exciting to hear Michael's comments on the weatherization workforce starting to ramp up. Um, obviously, that's been an area of focus and interest. Um, and I will just say that that Dan and his team are working hard with the governor and others um, at a time where we are worried about energy costs for Maine people and what winter um, will look like. The governor is absolutely, she talks to us about weatherization every day. How do we help more people stay warm in their homes? So just major area of focus. So Dan, if you're out there, I'm going to pass it off to you. Yeah, hey, good morning. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, great to uh, be with you on the road and joined by uh, Ken Colburn, uh, co-chair of the Energy Working Group. And yeah, Hannah, I think I would, I would echo that. Obviously, our office and, and the entire Energy Working Group are, are looking closely at global energy markets and the impact that um, it has to Maine's energy consumers. And um, we're, we're certainly doing that every day in the Energy Office and working across state government to look for Make sure that we're coordinating on opportunities for resources, um, and then also, um, you know, uh, working regionally with other states on that issue. I think I, w I do want to point out that you know we continue to be on track uh, to to meet our 80% RPS by 2030, and you know while the uh, uh, global uh, energy markets and particularly our uh, reliance on natural gas to create our electricity continues to um, cause some uncertainty and volatility, this summer the PUC did approve rate. Uh, reductions uh, for both uh, CMP and Versant, uh, largely based on uh, re the results of uh, beginning results of the uh, long-term contracts that came from the RPS legislation. So, 
um, uh, those contracts are are reducing rates now uh, in this time of and, and, uh, uh, really um, energy volatility. And so it's uh, good to see Maine increasing our energy independence, but also seeing the rate payer benefits from that as well. Next slide. So on the, uh, the second strategy around the, the clean energy uh, workforce and, and clean energy uh, workforce innovation, we have launched something called the Clean Energy Partnership, um, which is really focused on um, uh, on that strategy of how do we uh, double Maine's clean energy workforce, uh, including energy efficiency, uh, by 2030. So really bringing together uh, public and private uh, sector partners to uh, uh, advise uh, the state and uh, share resources and best practices when it comes to advancing the clean energy uh, workforce. We've uh, had one meeting of the Partnership Advisory Board and we'll be scheduling one in the next uh, few weeks to, to continue to meet. And so this is everyone from um, uh, uh, community colleges to industry to labor unions to uh, uh, construction, uh, looking at what are the needs, uh, what are the uh, opportunities as, as we uh, grow this industry. We've uh, launched a, uh, a, a workforce and training RFP funded by the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan and are, are going through those uh, responses now, uh, looking at efforts to um, begin to fund specific clean energy and energy efficiency workforce and training opportunities for Maine people. In addition, uh, we released or received a, a 2021 Clean Energy Industry Report, which showed um, uh, initial results for how the industry is, is doing, um, particularly during the pandemic. And what we found is that those clean energy jobs do did happen to be more resilient during the pandemic. Um, and while there was uh, declines like we, we, we've seen in other states, uh, we actually saw um, uh, fewer declines in other states, I think, as a result of, as a result of these policies. And then we've commissioned and expect to receive a, an updated workforce analysis report. So really looking at uh, what are the gaps uh, that are needed uh, to fill, um, and you know what programs and initiatives should should the state continue to look at as we try to grow this uh, the workforce of this sector. Um, so we're we're excited to receive that. We've been working closely with our partners in Department of Labor, Department of Education, and and others as we as we take this on. Next slide. So I won't go too much into detail on, on uh, a lot of what Michael and, and, and the transportation team covered around BIL. I'll just, you know, in, say that we're looking really closely at, um, again, how uh, Maine can best position ourselves to take advantage and, and compete for uh, the energy uh, provisions in, in BIL. There's more than $60, million, $60 billion administered by the U.S. Department of Energy to accelerate the clean energy transition. There's at least $50 million in formula funding, so funding that we are slated to receive for energy related programs. Uh, about 18 of that is in new programming, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then uh, more than 30 is uh, uh, going through main housing for their weatherization assistance program, uh, which they are putting together their plan for right now. We've uh, worked, uh, are working across state government uh, uh, and uh, through our sister agencies to look at other priorities and opportunities like you've heard uh, Joyce talk about with the NEVI plans and others. And then we're, we're working really closely with uh, the National Association of State Energy Officials, which uh, brings together uh, um, different state energy offices from across the country to lay out best practices uh, when it comes to programming and policies. And so uh, we're continuing to digest um, this information as it, as it comes out from and is launched by DOE. Some of it is coming faster than others, but we're um, um, spending a lot of time working on this. Next slide. So just at a really high level, I won't go into it uh, um, in, in too great a detail, but there are uh, the, you can see that there are four main formula funds uh, for which the state is slated to receive funding for, uh, about $4 million in the state energy program. Um, it's actually a little bit less, as we just uh, found out a week or so ago, more like 3.7, 3.8. Uh, more than $2 million a, uh, for a year for five years for grid resiliency programs, or otherwise known as the 40101D program. There's uh, energy efficiency funding uh, around 900,000 slated to come to the state. Um, uh, I'm sorry, that's for the, the revolving loan program and then uh, another 1.9 for conservation block grant program. So those are in various stages of being rolled out, uh, but ones that we're paying a lot of attention to and then you know, beginning and then going through the competitive programs as well that are in various stages of, of, um, of implementation at DOE. Next slide. 
I won't go through each of these, but you know there are, are uh, large dollar amounts of, of funding available for smart grid investments, transmission facilitation, uh, training and assessment centers, skills training, uh, energy efficiency improvements, industrial projects, um, and then uh, uh, the clean hydrogen hubs, which I'll which I'll talk about. So we're you know of that uh, 60 plus billion, we've uh, been monitoring you know a couple handful of, pro- uh, of opportunities, and um, um, I'm going through those. Next slide. Uh, Joyce talked about NEVI and electric vehicle work. I won't, I won't do that. And I think we've already kind of uh, hit some of the Justice 40 and federal requirements that are there. But I did want to note that the state has joined other Northeast partners in uh, a competitive um, um, uh, consortium around a clean energy hub. So looking at uh, a clean hydrogen hub. So looking at how, how clean hydrogen um, um, might fit into the state's energy future and the region's energy future as we as we seek to decarbonize and meet our clean energy and climate goals. Um, that is being um, other states like Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, and others are working on it. There's uh, $8 billion available for a handful of hydrogen hubs. And so we're excited to join with the other states um, to seek that funding. Um, we've also, with the other New England states, put out an RFI related to transmission needs in, in the Northeast. Uh, really looking at uh, uh, as we um, um, electrify uh, and add new resources, what transmission is going to be needed to interconnect, and how can we as a state work work together with other states to identify those needs and and potentially compete for uh, other federal funding, or at least um, um, have shared awareness with the other states and, and industry uh, and others about what um, transmission needs might be. And then finally, the 40101D program is the grid resiliency program that is coming through the uh, energy office. Um, uh, we have had one webinar, uh, one opportunity for public comment on that program. Uh, initially, we were uh, slated to have to apply by the end of this month. However, DOE has moved that uh, application date back to uh, March of next year. And so we are going to be having more opportunities for stakeholder engagement. Again, this is uh, $2.1, $2.2 million a year for five years uh, focused on a wide variety of grid resiliency opportunities. And so we've um, uh, have a uh, infrastructure page on the energy website you can see there and as we you know we'll be working with uh, uh, across across the state agencies to ensure that that's all coordinated um, but really you know we're looking for feedback and input as folks are looking at these with us as well next slide finally I yeah and so I think uh, the IRA, IRA has been mentioned I think we're excited about you know about all the opportunity that comes with the infrastructure reduction act you know, close to 370 billion uh, in funding. Um, a lot of that in tax credits for energy efficiency, which which uh, Michael's mentioned. There's clean vehicle credits as well, and then also uh, the extension of the renewable energy uh, credits and expansion of that, really to include other technologies. A lot of that is just being um, kind of understood about the potential impacts for Maine, but I think it's a really you know positive uh, uh, and exciting opportunity for the state. Um, and I'll just note that yesterday, it may have been mentioned, but yesterday the uh, White House released cleanenergy.gov as the beginning of, of an explainer of how um, how IRA would uh, impact uh, residents. And I think it's a, it's a good uh, tool for folks that are interested in beginning to learn about when some of these things kick in and how we should be thinking about them. So with that, uh, we'll turn it back to you, Hannah. Thanks, Dan. Um, I think I'll take it from here. And next up, I believe we have uh, Commissioner Beal, um, followed by Sarah Curran and Lucy Van Hook from the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future. Uh, And Amanda will be talking to us about the Land for Maine Futures grants, and then Sarah and Lucy talking some about the work being done by the Resiliency Working Group. Thank you so much. Um, I actually, I have a few different updates here. I think I was um, bridging sort of strategies D and E as well. Um, There's a lot of crossover uh, between the two and uh, the work that we're doing and others are doing at at the state level. So um, I I call this my tip of the iceberg update because there's so much more that's happening. Uh, A lot of work going on around both of these strategies, but just to uh, bring up a few. Um, yeah, I'll, I will start. Actually, I'll start by um, explaining the photograph here on this slide. Um, this is the Department of Inland Fish- Fisheries and Wildlife's new uh, electric truck. And I understand that they're they're starting with this one and they're going to be 
be bringing three more into the fleet um, in the near future. And that's just also a good opportunity to highlight that uh, likewise, we at the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry and other departments in the state are really taking seriously this opportunity to lead by example, uh, exploring opportunities to electrify our vehicle fleets, as well as to look at renewable energy opportunities as we do plan maintenance and upgrades to any of our physical infrastructure around the state. Um, so that's really exciting. I also wanted to just touch on our Lands Remains Future program, which does live in the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. However, um, it is a really important program for a number of agencies. And I, along with Commissioner Camuso from IFW and Commissioner Kelleher from DMR, are board members of this uh, important program. And and, you know, this this program does play into a uh, very important, uh, an important role in one of the natural and working lands recommendations that you'll recall that ended up in the climate action plan, which is around avoiding conversion of our natural and working lands to other uses and protecting them from development. And so with LMF, uh, as everybody on this call probably remembers, um, we had a, we've got a wonderful opportunity before us because the governor uh, proposed and the legislature agreed to appropriate $40 million to this program. And I will say that the board has been very, very busy uh, over the last several months um, working on uh, reviewing proposals and uh, making decisions to fund some really great conservation pro projects. Um, we've got 20 projects in the queue. Um, they total about $5.6 million uh, in funding, which will leverage more than $8 million in matching federal funds. And the work is ongoing. In fact, at the next uh, meeting, we'll be looking at some new proposals. Uh, we'll also be looking at the first new working farmland projects in many, many years. And so very exciting to be moving forward on this front. Um, the next update I just wanted to share was uh, around a soil carbon study that we just completed. And by completed, I, I would say that we completed it to the point that we have um, fulfilled the, legislat the legislation that put us on the path to do this work. Um, we just turned a report into the Ag Conservation and uh, Forestry Committee. This is work that we did in partnership with Inland Fish and Wildlife. And the charge was really to look at opportunities to enhance carbon storage in soils of um, agriculture, forestry, natural lands, so working in natural lands across the board. It was, it was broad, uh, really fascinating. We did not have any funding appropriated to, to us to do this work, but thankfully, uh, GoPIF helped us to get a grant from the um, US Climate Alliance that allowed us to uh, contract with the University of Maine which uh, Ivan Fernandez, who I believe is on this call, was just instrumental along with some of his colleagues in uh, doing a great baseline analysis uh, and literature review, really looking at what do we know about soil carbon and what do we know about enhancing storage in all of these different landscapes. So that was just a really good foundation for us to launch from. We, um, we had a, a, a committee that worked on this. We also did a series of stakeholder roundtables to get feedback on different ideas around um, strategies. And then we had a public review comment and all of that coalesced into, I think 14 total uh, recommendations, eight of which we pulled forward as priorities. Um, and so that report is out there available. If anybody would like to see it, I'm, I'd be happy to get the link to you. To you. Um, we're also very busy working on standing up our Healthy Soils Program within the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources. This is a program that was established uh, in the past legislative session. And so we're really uh, excited to be uh, talking with stakeholders and looking at ways that we can uh, incentivize uh, healthy soil practices in agricultural settings and also to support really good efforts like the Healthy Soils Network that is already established and doing good work around the state um, and involves many uh, key partner organizations that we work with on a regular basis like Cooperative Extension and um, uh, Maine Farmland Trust and others. So <clears throat> that's that's underway as well. Um, and then I just wanted to mention, I'm sure you all remember, we had a forest carbon task force um, that did a lot of good work uh, previously, put out a report, had recommendations, and we're 
we're working on the implementation of that, uh, many of the recommendations in that report. Um, just to pull forward a couple, uh, we're working to stand up a, some new district ranger positions that are going to really out, uh, expand our ability to do outreach to smaller landowners um, and encourage them to develop forest management plans and provide other types of technical assistance as was identified as important in that report. Um, we're also working to stand up a position that we're excited about and it would bring expertise to the Maine Forest Service around forest carbon um, programs and opportunities to enhance forest carbon um, <clears throat> sequestration. Uh, and so that's that's another report that's out there. Happy to post a link or provide a link to anybody that would like to see it if they have not done so, if they haven't had a chance to look at it already. Um, and finally, just a couple of other initiatives I'll mention, and then I'll turn it back over here. Um, we, we, Hannah and I and others, we've talked a lot about how do we measure success. And so one of the places where we know we need to do some work is um, really updating our understanding of how much food that is grown in Maine is consumed here. There have been, there's been a, a, a number out there that we've used for a long time that, you know, 10% of the food that we grow here is consumed here, the rest is exported. And likewise, we import the balance of our diet. And I think it's time to, to really update and look at that number. Vermont has a really uh, good uh, methodology for doing this work uh, in their state. And so we've had a series of conversations with them and we see an opportunity to uh, try to duplicate that, not only so that we have a better understanding what, what we're doing here and how we're progressing over time, but also so we can have conversations with other states in New England like Vermont and understand sort of apples to apples, what's going on, not apples to oranges, if we all had different methodologies that we're using. Um, and also to that front, on that front of really increasing opportunities for in-state consumption of Maine grown foods, we just recently announced um, uh, about uh, just over $19 million worth of grants that will be going out to 64 um, successful applicants of the agriculture infrastructure investment program. Um, it was a hugely subscribed to program. We had about 850 applications of the 19 million plus that we had to give out. We actually received about $180 million in requests. So we are also working hard. We don't feel like that's the end of that story. We're working hard to identify other sources of funding um, because there are a lot of really great ideas that were put forth and we wanna see them move forward. And we're also working on standing up uh, an agriculture and forestry fund, which we think can be part of the solution going forward to continue funding innovative ideas that will move us forward on our, um, in our goals around the climate action plan. So I'll stop there and thank you so much. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Curran. I work in the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future, um, and we are helping to support the Governor's Infrastructure Implementation Committee, which includes a resilience working group. And so I want to just talk briefly about some of the work that that group is doing. Um, the Governor established the Infrastructure Implementation Committee through executive order uh, to coordinate around the bipartisan infrastructure law, infrastructure law opportunities and to make sure that Maine receives the maximum benefit from this federal funding for transportation, climate and economic opportunities um, and some once in a lifetime funding opportunities. Um, the priority uh, or a priority of the committee is to make sure that they're aligning investments and opportunities with state plans, including Maine won't wait. Um, and in addition to some of the transportation, energy and energy efficiency opportunities that folks have mentioned earlier on today's call, um, there's also significant funding and programs to strengthen the state's preparation for storm events and flooding and wildfires. Um, to build resilience in our transportation networks, in our drinking water and wastewater systems, um, and to improve the natural capacity of our watersheds and ecosystems. Um, so the resilience working group of this committee was established to prioritize natural resource and resilience projects, and it's comprised of state agencies with priorities and programs that, inter that intersect with Maine's natural and working lands and landscapes or watersheds or with uh, natural disaster preparation and response. So they're really focused on projects that are complex and that require interagency collaboration in order to achieve impact at a landscape scale. 
Um, and these opportunities to invest in resilience also present opportunities for state and tribal collaboration on priority projects and the need to partner with uh, nonprofits and regional and municipal governments. In order to support competitive applications from Maine, our office has received some private funds from philanthropy to support a couple of contract positions. Um, and they're gonna assist with interagency collaboration with the development and application for funding opportunities um, in support of those large scale projects of statewide significance. And so I wanted to introduce Lucy Van Hook this morning, um, who's been assisting us with these efforts. And she's gonna talk about a couple of specific projects. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Cassie, could you go to the next slide, please? Great, I just wanted to share one example from a grant application that I helped support under the GoPIF office. And it came up as an example of a great model of interagency and uh, nonprofit partner and municipal government collaboration. And so this project is specific to the Wallistic St. John River watershed. The photo that you see here is a map of the entire watershed. As you can see, it encompasses northern Maine and parts of southern Canada. So it's quite a large area here and definitely qualifies as landscape and watershed scale project. And so Molly Doherty from the Maine Natural Areas Program shared at the Resilience Working Group kickoff meeting that she was really pleased with this model, both in terms of project development and the way the grant application came together. Specifically, it's about the Wallistic St. John Watershed Restoration Program, and it focuses on improving habitat connectivity, fish passage, and stormwater management. And it really is a great partnership between the Maine Office of uh, Department of Transportation, Ag Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, Federal Highway Administration is at the table, Northern Maine Development Commission is there representing municipalities. And then there are also nonprofit partners at the table, like the Nature Conservancy and Trout Unlimited. And here is a really innovative and new way of working together. The administrative authority is with the new newly formed Maliseet Community Development Authority, which is in association with the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians. They're matching funds from private philanthropy at the table, and we submitted an application to the National Foundation of Wildlife, uh, sorry, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, America the Beautiful Challenge, and it, which pulls for BIL funding opportunities. And it's using everyone's strengths at the table to move this project forward. And they're really hoping that this model can scale because it's uh, working to protect a globally unique habitat. Now I'll turn it back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so we just wanted to give you a little update under the umbrella of natural working lands, just to, to point out that the BIL funds, um, they're incredible for some of the emission reduction strategies in Maine Won't Wait, and they're also um, really once in a lifetime funding opportunities for some of our natural resource goals as well. So I wanted to, to share that update with you. Thanks. Thank you both so much for that. This project is a great example of uh, how some of these funds can be used to develop pilots that we could use as models for future projects as well. So thanks for highlighting that one in particular. Um, I think next up, we're gonna get an update from Kirsten Brewer from Volunteer Maine about some of the climate core work. Hi, yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me here. I'm Kirsten with the Volunteer Maine Office. We are the State Service Commission. Um, and if you're not familiar with our office, our mission is to build capacity and sustainability in Maine's volunteer and service sectors. We do that um, partly by developing and funding programs, and we also provide support for professional volunteer managers. Um, so I started my position in May. Um, my position is funded by ARP funds which were allocated to our commission through our federal funding agency. Um, and I'm here for a three-year appointment um, to do all I can to help stand up the Climate Corps in Maine. Um, and if you could go to the next, please. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah, so our vision for the Climate Corps is, is really a Climate Corps network. So imagine an, umbr an umbrella group with multiple programs, all in different focus areas, and all striving generally towards the goals of Maine Won't Wait. Um, if you want to learn more about the, the vision and the structure for the the new network, um, do look on our website. Um, there is a 
we, we published a report in January 2022 that was based on an in-depth study with a lot of different stakeholders. And you can see um, this, this bigger vision for the Climate Corps. Um, I really believe uh, Climate Corps is a tremendous opportunity for us to meet the goals of engaging Maine's people and communities in climate action because specifically of the, the triple bottom line of service. So service programs, number one, will deliver meaningful action um, in, on climate change. Um, Number two, the programs will provide a pathway for careers in climate action. And number three, the service can actually strengthen communities through increased capacity and civic engagement of local residents. Um, yeah, could you go to the next, please? Um, and can go ahead and hit next. So um, how to get involved. So last meeting you learned about LD 1974 passed in the last session. And this is going to fund one program under the umbrella of the Climate Corps. Uh, the RFA is currently open. It's due on September 23rd. And we decided to choose one focus area because it is just a modest amount of funding. So the focus area will be on energy efficiency education and home energy conservation. And due to the energy crisis, which we heard about earlier this morning, we really felt this this was the most urgent area um, to invest in to help Mainers save money and, and stay warm um, as soon as possible. Um, go to the next though, next slide please. Um, this is not the only opportunity for Climate Corps. So currently we are also recruiting host sites for the Maine Service Fellows Program. Um, this is an opportunity for communities in rural areas to host a fellow to address the community's major challenges. We're specifically targeting rural counties because often it's the smallest uh, counties that have the least amount of resources and can't even take advantage of state and federal programs. So we want to help add some capacity to help them be competitive and, and do some outreach and engagement for these programs. Um, can go to the next, please. Um, our largest uh, amount of funding remains the AmeriCorps program, um, which we administer those funds here in Maine. So we'll be opening competitions this fall and again in the winter to help organizations develop new AmeriCorps programs that could be aligned with our, our Climate Corps goals. So now is the time to reach out and connect with our office and think about your needs and propose solutions that Climate Corps members could work on. Um, think of AmeriCorps as the human resources to activate and implement your projects. Uh, there's a lot of options options and opportunities with AmeriCorps. So we're here to help you think through those opportunities um, and think about a, a great solution with, with the Climate Corps. Um, and even if you're a small group and you think you need just a handful of members to help you with a project, do reach out because we can help um, create some coalitions and networks where we could stand up a larger core here in Maine. Um, and next, please. And if you're hearing this and thinking, I would like to join the Climate Corps, or I know someone who would be a great Climate Corps member, also do reach out and check out our website because we have existing programs in Maine who are actively recruiting members to be involved with climate action. Um, so they're great opportunities to gain skills, to serve that, that folks get involved with. So, you know, do reach out, do see what, what's available. Um, climate Corps is actively is happening um, and only growing. Um, so this is a very quick overview, um, but please reach out with questions or feedback and, and we're looking forward to meeting more people who wanna get involved with Climate Corps. So thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Again, another um, really exciting to see kind of an idea in the climate plan. It actually came out of a number of the working groups, this concept and move forward in the legislature with Representative Riley and others really pushing the legislature getting on board and, and then obviously to see it now coming to pass. So I think I think it's very well time though that this doesn't really work unless we have people engaged in organizations and universities and businesses. So I think your, your, um, your pitch here is really important and good timing. I think the early energy efficiency and conservation incredibly relevant, so just thank you. Um, so this is one of the uh, several parts of um, the, uh, and Jesse Perkins is already asking, how can municipalities get engaged? So I would actually say um, our next conversation, so we're going to stop talking at you quite so much. Um, we have really the, the rest of this meeting to, to, we sort of piled on all of these things happening, all of these opportunities in, in transportation, in buildings, in resilience, in communities, um, and the sort of, I think the, the challenge that, that we in state government um, cannot take on alone is sort of how do we engage 
main people, main businesses, and in communities in as many ways possible. Because I think what, what we are seeing, what you've seen through these many, many, we've used all the acronyms, BIL, IRA, Main Jobs Recovery, ARPA, I mean, every one of these represents a uh, robust funding stream, most of those funding streams that won't last forever. Um, so the ability for, for people, communities, businesses, other entities to engage um, in how to take advantage of these programs, how we especially make sure that these programs are delivered to those communities and people who least, you know, are not paying attention, who don't have the resources or technical assistance to engage. That is really kind of the challenge of, um, of our work right now. So next slide, Cassie. Um, Tony and I wanted to just quickly recap. We've obviously done some work around communications, public communication through a website to kind of start to make more simple and practical the climate plan and the things that people could do. And then uh, we also held a conference, which many of you attended. So I'm just gonna let Tony give a quick recap of that work. Um, and then we want to hear from you for really the rest of this meeting, some thoughts about kind of everything you've heard today. It's all exciting, but it's only exciting if people continue to sort of think about how we do the work, communicate the work, and especially help those who are at least able to navigate these programs, engage in them. Um, again, we, we're trying many, many ways of doing it. And you've heard some, some strategies and, and folks like Efficiency Maine and the Climate Corps are doing that heavy lifting. Um, but again, it's, it's really about sort of our ongoing ways of engaging. So Tony, I'll, give, I'll, I'll pass it off to you for a couple of comments and then we're really gonna open it up to a conversation. Sounds great, thanks, Anna. Uh, again, for those of you that know, don't know me, Tony Ronzio, I'm Deputy Director of GOPIF. I handle communications and external affairs for our agency, um, and so and many of you were there. So, Kathy, if you can just jump to the to the next slide, um, we held our first conference um, on June seventeenth at the Augusta Civic Center called "Communities Leading on Climate." Um, we ended up with a really good turnout, and I have to say, a tremendous amount of work and heavy lifting went from the entirety of the GOPIF and GEO staff to really pull this off. Um, so, we had five hundred and twenty-eight attendees in person and virtual. Um, we had a live virtual keynote by White House Climate Advisor Gene McCarthy, um, the Governor, Senator King, Representative Pingree, Representative Senator, Golan, uh, Senator Collins, Representative Golden, all spoke. Um, we announced Efficiency Maine's uh, terrific $15 million uh, fund from MJRP um, that is going towards energy efficiency projects in municipal buildings, schools, nonprofits. That's got a, a really good press attention out of the conference. And we also had a tremendous lineup of speakers and um, almost no sell job to get people to come and speak at our conference. A lot of people were very excited and come share their stories about what's happening in their municipalities um, and also to host uh, workshops in the afternoon. And I, um, those of you that were there, you all saw it, I saw it too, um, was really gratifying to have 11 concurrent workshops happening, all of them full all of them would really engage people for a full day at the Augusta Civic Center. So um, a really successful conference, a really successful first effort to kind of bring the climate plan to the communities it's meant to help um, and to the audiences it's meant to help. And um, a lot of work, but we are now thinking next year about um, not only doing you know, a, a large convening like this, but we did get some feedback from folks uh, after, from attendees after this conference expressing an interest in smaller events, different places around the state, a mix of um, you know, full virtual events, uh, a mixture of uh, in-person convening. And we're taking all that feedback and trying to figure out what we can pull off uh, to continue this momentum into next year and maybe bring the climate plan into new audiences. So it could be communities on climate, it could be businesses on climate or nonprofits on climate. We're trying to figure out the right, the right mix of that so and put an event schedule together for, for next year. So. Again, a lot of credit for GOPIF and GEO staff for pulling this off. Um, a lot of fun, good feedback, and we can't wait to do it again. I'm just gonna, I'm glad we're recording this. Tony talked about how fun it was to pull off a conference. It is a lot of heavy lifting. And again, many of you were there. Thank you. It was great to see people in real life. Um, Cassie, will you jump to the next slide? So we'll just put this slide up for, for a couple mi minute or two, and then we'll take away the slides and, and try to all see each other. I'd love to just open this up for conversation, sort of um, any takeaways you had from the conference and not, you know, not necessarily, doesn't have to be all specifics about that conference, but this was obviously one way of engaging people. Um, it's, a, it's a way of engaging people that takes a little bit more work, but it's also 
um, you know, it's it's something that that people like to be together and they um, pay more attention sometimes when you're all there together. Um, but I, again, I, I'd like the climate council, those folks who are in the room to sort of honestly look, reflect on on kind of everything you've heard this morning. Like it, most of what you've heard, if it wasn't clear, are about opportunities for action in communities, opportunities that consumers can take, um, but there are often barriers to people being able to take action. So um, I think that this conversation sort of helps to guide our staff, but also our partners work over the next year. Um, and then I think, you know, we're we're going to be in the run up to the next climate action plan too soon as well. So um, just open it up to all of you, maybe take down the discussion um, so we can see everybody and um, would just love to hear any feedback again, specifically about the conference, but then kind of the bigger picture question of engagement and really engagement in the kinds of opportunities we have uh, for climate action, again, based on unprecedented funding, interest, engagement. So who wants to go first? Representative Bloom. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm totally blown away by this presentation all day this, this morning. Um, so much, so much to absorb. I have a lot of questions about it, but I, I'm going to go first to um, your request about feedback on the the the, uh, the wonderful meeting we had. I thought it was really good, and um, my only my one of my comments is that it was really geared towards the community, like the like the the larger community, like groups of people getting together, um, but like towns, um, and I think that though though that there's a feeling that we need to be we need to empower individuals a bit more in our messaging on what we can do individually as well as with community because you know there's there's a there's a couple of problems with just focusing on a community because that can create a barrier to uh, to other parts of that community that want to get involved that can't because of the strictness of how we're doing um RFPs, for example, we want to be able to encourage all sorts of groups that want to do this work. So I guess that just to think of community in a little more broader sense is one of my feedback comments. Great. Thank you, Lydia. Um, others, just jump in. You can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and shout it out. See Sandy Buck unmuting himself. Where are we? Here I'm, we go. I'm, un, I'm unmuting myself. I've got a question. Uh, and, and Lydia, I'm in the same boat. I'm blown away by how much has been done. And all I can say is thank goodness for all the federal funding. Otherwise, this would, would have been a lot of fancy dreaming that we've been doing. So this is great. We're going to put, put money to it. Um, Kirsten Brewer, welcome. And, uh, and I'm curious about the Climate Core work and what are your opportunities to interact with the non-governmental organizations, the nonprofits in the state, and uh, for boots on the ground for support, and then obviously to draw in uh, philanthropic dollars to support that uh, either directly through the state projects or through the NGOs that are partnering with you. So I'm looking for uh, for good ideas there. I'm sure you've got a whole bunch of them. Yes, thank you for asking that. Yeah, so our office, primarily, we are a grant making office. We, I don't supervise Climate Corps members, I won't be recruiting them. We make grants to partner organizations who will stand up and sponsor those Climate Corps programs. That definitely could be nonprofit partners, that could be other state agencies, higher education, um, uh, faith-based group, labor, labor organizations, it's a wide range. So we welcome um, engagement from the nonprofit community, absolutely. Um, and a common theme, however, is that uh, a lot of main communities, main nonprofits are really small, like Representative Bloom was saying, and don't have the resources to manage a federal grant or uh, you know, don't have the volunteer practices in place. So additional resources to support and support from larger agencies with the administrative experience is very much welcome. Uh, I would just 
uh, unmute and chime in as Hannah suggests and, and uh, the um, sort of trying hard to keep up with the acronyms and the amount of, of activities that are going on. And, and we've just talked about a subset, of course, this morning of uh, the many things that uh, emanate from Maine won't wait and having a plan. But I think someone already said it this morning, but I couldn't find it in the chat for, for appropriate attribution. But the incredible importance of having a climate action plan uh, and having this framework in which to target and direct uh, and guide all of the activity and and given the urgency of the work that we do collectively, um, that's only going to accelerate. And so um, it gets it's really important uh, that we continue on this path, which we've been on for a while of uh, having a, a unified science informed climate action plan. Uh, and as Hannah mentions, uh, beginning the the uh, the lead up to the update of it. Um, so just just applause and whoever is smart enough to make the thumbs float across the screen, uh, I, I, cool to do it. Hey, Hannah, can I hop on here? Yes, please, Judy, go for it. So I echoing again, just I, I am blown away by how much is going on and has been accomplished. So kudos to multiple agencies there. Um, as I was listening to, um, you know, what we've described as the fire hose of federal money that is available now and is pending, it occurs to me, I looked at the participant list, I do see some of the regional planning agencies there. I'm not sure I see all the regional coordinators funded by Community Resilience Partnership, but it occurs to me that um, I mean, I'm getting phone calls from people that I used to work with in Washington County. What about this? What about that? And I can't keep up with all of these funding sources. This webinar, this meeting is a fantastic summary. And then the links that are on those on the slides. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is get that out to this recording and this slide deck out to the regional coordinators. Brian, I'm, I'm thinking you have the same idea, um, but also to the regional planning councils um, to then get it out even further because because they're often the ones that are going to help some of those tiny little towns uh, to apply for this money. So um, I, I guess I would also encourage, like everyone here has a network, and to, to recommend that this summary is one of the best to say, to realize what's been happening and to get the links to the places where the money is flowing and will be flowing very soon. Because I think the message that this is the time to move is really important because this money is, is, is once in a lifetime. So that's just my comment. Thank you, Judy. And that's, I think, helpful. And I think, I know you, you've been fielding this and leading this work. I'd say, you know, we are uh, working on a bipartisan infrastructure law website so that it has kind of a home for communities. But then again, the Community Resilience Partnership is also a communications channel. And, and really, this is this is actually I mean, what we've understood. And I will say Sandy and some of the climate funders have really helped to increase our ability to do this work is small towns, you know, are, are just like many individual consumers, they're busy, they don't have the time and the bandwidth. So, you know, how do we really help people through um, the opportunities and make sure they don't miss them? I think that point is just very, very well said, Judy. So I, I will say we are continuing to try to stand up more, just even here are the opportunities, but we know that people also need need help because federal grants, for example, even state grants, they do take time and effort that, that not everybody is, is prepared for. So uh, Kate, I see you're off uh, mute. Except we can't hear you. Nope, you're you're just no noise coming out of you today. Maybe you're gonna have to put in the chat or you could leave and come back. I'm not. Kate was gonna say something very I could hear her. She was using her hands. Yeah. Um other other comments. Yeah, back to this uh, writing of 
uh, of grants that you just mentioned and the need for resources for that on probably all levels. And what, what do we have in place in terms of like workforce training? What do we have in place to help uh, expand that capacity on many different levels? Like for example, could we do something with the volunteer main group? Could someone be hired to basically be a, uh, to help figure out, uh, to help manage grant writing uh, or, or to, for, to find these funds? Um, I, I just, I, I guess I, I always hear about this. I don't write grants, never have. So I, 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 I kind of would like to know the depth and the breadth of what, of what, that, what we're really saying when you say we need that kind of uh, expertise. Kirsten, I don't know. I know the GP Cog actually had a resilience core that was doing some of this work, and I do think that is really a, just a well placed question, Representative Bloom. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so the GP Cog um, Greater Portland Council of Governments sponsors an AmeriCorps program called the Resilience Core, and they have members in house at GP Cog as well as placed in um, host site uh, communities, municipalities to help with a wide range of resilience activities, not just climate, but it could be working on the climate action plan. Um, AmeriCorps members are limited in how much fundraising they can do. That's not meant to be the main purpose of AmeriCorps, um, but they can do some, so helping with grant writing, but also that research. And I think it's actually, and it'd be interesting to hear from others on the call, but communities need a, a step back before the grant writing. They need to do the outreach and engagement and planning to be ready to know what, what are the problems that we have to tackle, which is the priority and what are the solutions that will work here. So that's where a, a, I think a strong role of Climate Corps members could fit in around that outreach, um, you know, organizing community meetings to get that feedback. And that's exactly what the main service fellows is all about. So only in rural counties, only in rural communities, um, the fellow will be placed in the community to help um, build volunteer networks, get feedback, and they're not AmeriCorps members, so they're allowed to do fundraising. Okay, Hannah, can you hear me? Um, let me just build on that and then I'll go back to the conference for a second. Um, Lucy Van Hook's example was, I think, a, just one, I know, just one example of what I think we're starting to see happen right now, which is the state, tribal governments, um, planning commissions, municipalities, and the NGO community working together to get these um, grant proposals in. We're seeing that in um, Down East, and um, all up and down the coast with some of the uh, NOAA funding, just this amazing collaborative process. And obviously I come from a larger uh, NGO with the Nature Conservancy, but what's been super rewarding is um, working with a ton of partners is to be able to work with local communities and NGOs who do know their area much more deeply than someone like we might. And so bringing those skills together, I think having Lucy on deck has been a huge help. Um, and um, I think kind of one help the state could continue to give is identifying where, or, or another organization, identifying where you're seeing um, capacity needed so that those of us who can be responsive relatively quickly can help. Um, so that was just, I think, a great point. And there's been some great examples today of, of those um, innovations. Um, super, just quickly back to the conference. Um, maybe it was like post COVID and we were all hardly post COVID, but all very excited to see each other in person. Um, I thought there was a ton of energy and, you know, hearing stories from communities um, was great. And my panel, I mean, I think we just had a blast getting to know each other and prepping almost as much as anything. It was just so cool to work together. Um, this may be stating the obvious, to what next? Um, we've had so much success or our, the youth in the state have had so much success influencing the Climate Council and we heard some of those examples today. I do think if um, working with Maine Environmental Ed, 
the Climate Initiative, Tree Street Youth, et cetera, et cetera, those organizations that are really connected to um, young people and organizing would be a great um, way for us all to make a commitment to the, I won't even say the next generation. I think most of the time I should just get out of the way, but um, it's great. It would, I think that would be a really wonderful way for us to join together. Hooray, hooray, Kate. I love that. Really good. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. Um, Mary Alice, you joined us and you, you are also with Volunteer Maine. Feel free to chime in. Yes, sorry. I was stuck in webinar land with no option to raise a hand. <laughs> so thank you for letting me in. Um, I wanted to go back to the funding issue for uh, Climate Corps and for service fellows and those opportunities for engagement. One of the thing that's one of the things that's unusual about um, the AmeriCorps federal program is that other federal agencies, specifically like Interior and NOAA and Education and a longer list, would like their funds to be used to support the, the um, living and participation uh, costs for AmeriCorps members. So it's an allowable use uh, for it. And it's a way to, because everything comes to Maine and any other state uh, in the AmeriCorps land based on our population. So guess where we land? Uh, the way we get to grow and engage more folks is by, um, partnering with other federal sources. So just wanted to point that out for people. And you can do that also in the sub grants that you make by uh, pointing out that an allowable use is for, and this would also be true for Climate Corps and Service Fellows. Great, thank you. And I would just say, I mean, uh, Mary Alice and Kirsten are both here. I just think this is a big opportunity that we are really hoping that diverse organizations do take advantage of. And, and I think to Kate's point, I just, there are a lot of young people in Maine who want to do something and sort of creating these opportunities where they can really plug into action. And, you know, whether it's talking to people about energy efficiency and the programs Efficiency Maine is running or helping communities with resilience planning. It's, I think it's just, a, it could be very exciting, but we want to make it work. And that's only going to happen if folks engage and, and help this. So, um, We've been talking a lot about communities. Um, I will just say that um, businesses um, and sort of other organizations are really on our list. I see Pat's hand up, including farmers, including the, the uh, lots of diverse and innovative forestry um, companies. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Pat, but I just sort of planting a seed that that uh, business engagement is sort of next up on our list. We 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 step back from some of it during COVID because businesses were really underwater. Michael has some new programs, but I, I would just say it's sort of the next area for robust engagement because um, we have so many businesses in Maine already doing a ton. So Pat and then Ken. Yeah, can you hear me? All right. Yeah, I just uh, lots of wonderful things happening. So I'm uh, encouraged in what I see, but I did want to talk about the private sector and just a couple of examples of uh, innovation and investment in Maine that relate to climate change. In the last two weeks, uh, Louisiana Pacific expanded um, its line of wood siding for homes. That's a great thing for the region, for the economy, um, as well as putting more durable carbon sequestering types of products into uh, homes. So that's a great opportunity. And uh, there was an open house at the uh, Groshu Mill in West Enfield uh, last week. And that is uh, pretty exciting. By the time Chris and Jason Groshu are done, they'll have built the biggest uh, softwood pine mill in Maine. And that is really important because it replaced some of the softwood markets that were lost along that uh, Penobscot River. Um, alleyway there and um, again they're making two by fours they have a biochar facility that is going to be sited on their property and of course they're looking to include uh, cross laminated timber 
developers to uh, come on the site. So a lot of really good uh, things that are happening and investments being made. I think that sawmill in West Enfield is uh, a $60 million investment. And those folks have benefited as well as uh, LP from state funding programs um, and efficiency main projects that uh, would, would, they would qualify for because they'll put in wood turbines to help with their energy demand as well. So lots happening in the private sector as well. Thank you, Pat, that's great. Ken. Um, thanks, Hannah. Um, again, excited that all of the things going on, um, reinforcing Kate's point, uh, reinforced by Ivan about the importance of having had a plan so that we could move quickly when the federal opportunities arose. Um, a couple of other ways I think we can be prepared is to take a lesson out of the era playbook. Uh, our federal agencies are not expert or very experienced at uh, getting large sums of money out quickly and put to productive use. Um, and those who remember the era days may also remember the bouncing ball of different requirements that agencies and states faced. Um, I, don't, I don't know how I would advise the Maine Climate Council to prepare for that likely eventuality, but I would somehow do so. You know, let's, let's be on guard that that's likely to happen. And another way I think we can prepare is uh, it may be wise for us to challenge some of our fundamental assumptions. On the energy side, for example, we have a statewide procurement of energy that means that utilities don't procure energy, the state does. Um, that means that they have less freedom in procuring uh, energy that we might want them to, like from various renewable resources. So that creates a, a lot of issues. We also have continue to have interconnection issues. Um, they are prohibited, as I understand it still, largely from, from using storage, even though that's vital for grid modernization. So that, you know, rather than create the whole list here, I just offer that it may be a wise time to challenge some of our existing fundamental assumptions as well in order to allow us to move ahead more rapidly and more effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And I will just say, I think, I mean, Ken's point is actually, I won't, I won't cut off the conversation now, but it's a good lead in to, um, sort of the next phase of, of climate planning in the areas where we need to, to dig in, um, both in our sort of to make our current plan work and, and to think about the next four years. Um, Judy. Yeah, I had a question that comes out of a conversation I had with some friends um, a couple of days ago about incentivizing uh, procurement of main based uh, forest products um, that serve the purpose of forest of uh, carbon sequestration. So, you know, we were just bouncing ideas around about, you know, how can you incentivize purchase of, you know, flooring and siding and all those types of materials that are vinyl and plastic um, and purchased because they're cheaper. Um, and I'm just wondering, I you know, of all this money that's out there linking these two ideas, and maybe it's through, it's through um, a grant that covers the sales tax or provides rebates or in some way incentivizes and assists people to use main force products in building as opposed to plastic and vinyl products. And I'm wondering if that is part of anyone's thinking or conversation. So Pat, any ideas? Yeah, Pat or Michael Stoddard, I will say that one of the strategies of our climate plan is that the state lead by example in using these products. And I know that Elaine Clark is out there. I mean, that is certainly something that has been focused on for new construction. I know Maine Housing thinks about it. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff happening um, regardless things on Pat's list. Um, I think those companies are cost competitive and really doing well in the market, but I, I, I put that out to, to Pat or Michael um, or to Kathleen, co-chairs of the buildings working group, just other thoughts. I, I think it's, uh, it's a good idea. It's, um, well, 
and I, I think it would help with uh, local economies. Some of these um, facilities have a huge scale though, and they're, um, they're selling products on the East Coast, if not into the interior. So um, that, that's just a factor. It'd be a percentage of what they sell in name, but we could take a look at that and see if it makes sense. There's, um, if you look at CLT, for example, we're really, uh, we've got a chicken and egg kind of uh, problem in that we want to build more structures with CLT. We want to locate a facility in Maine. We want to incentivize that maybe in some way, but we also have to build the market. Um, for people to accept those products. And that's uh, that's been a challenge for us. It's gonna happen. There'll be a facility located on the East Coast. Um, uh, so that's just some of the thinking that goes into it, but it, it's not a bad idea, Judy, and be glad to think about that some more. Yeah, I'll chime in. Um, I do think that having public entities like state government and municipal government lead by example is the right way to start with what Judy's talking about. Um, I think they can do that through their procurement preferences and, and decisions. Um, I'm, I'm sort of racking my brain to think about the programs we run and the, and the measures, what we call measures that we incentivize through market-based approaches and frankly, we don't do anything that I can, that comes immediately to mind that involves sort of the exterior siding or the framing of a building. We don't do windows, we don't do doors. I know you think we do, but we don't. Um, we do insulation. Now there are different ways to make insulation and, and the market is uh, partly because of regulations that are coming out of DEP and, and recent legislation the market is shifting away from some of the, the kinds of substances that you're describing that were used in insulation and, and towards things that have lower carbon content. Um, but in any case, I just also want to point out that everything you pointed to, um, Judy, might, you know, what, in the programs we run, we're trying to get customers to make purchasing decisions and we're trying to sprinkle it, financial incentives in strategically to get them to make good decisions that will help them save energy as an end use um, or switch to cleaner energy. And so you always have to balance um, the point you're making, which is a good one about things we would like to prioritize and we would like to see more of with also what consumers will choose and what they will find useful for the applications they have and will be able for them to do so at the lowest cost, you know? So I, I don't happen to know anything about whether those things cost twice as much or three times as much or whether they're comparable. But if they cost more, we have to be mindful that we also wanna help people insulate their homes or, or switch their heating systems. Um, and it may be that some of those things are made other, out of different, different substances, I just don't know. Sounds like a good subject for both both applies to the Natural Working Lands Group, but also the Buildings Working Group. And I, I just would say, I mean, it cer certainly is, I will say part of the theme of the climate plan is, and the jobs component is increasing the use of embodied carbon products, local foods, uh, main, main grown energy, energy independence. I mean, I think it all fits into this theme. And I think consumers in Maine, um, again, if they can afford it, if it's cost competitive, um, if it helps their neighbors, um, certainly we've seen a positive response there. So um, just helpful conversation, Judy, and thank you, Pat and Michael. Um, we are getting close to time. We don't want to run over, but I just want to, um, is there any last comment before Melanie and I wrap it up? Um, I will just say uh, sort of our, our Cassie, you want to bring up our, our last slide, just a reminder of what's next. Um, our plan is uh, to meet again on December 1. That is the two year anniversary of the climate plan. Um, our hope is, and our plan is that we are together in person. Um, I think it's gonna be an exciting time to kind of dig in. We hope it's um, planning for a bit of a longer day where we can talk about 
topics in more detail. I will say it's both an evaluation of the progress we've made in each of the areas, um, thinking about the next two years and how we um, ensure our progress or, or kind of push in areas where we're not doing um, as much as we had hoped. Um, we also are starting to think about the next climate plan uh, to make a four-year plan. Took us a while the first time around, so it's it's something that we will also um, talk about. Um, and I will also say we'll start to talk about the equity subcommittee, um, their, their report that will come to us, which is really ensuring that the work of the Climate Council um, is meeting all the people in communities of Maine, uh, especially those who are disadvantaged. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in real life again, um, but uh, just hold the date December 1. Um, again, we're, we're grateful for these meetings that are action packed. We're throwing a lot of information at you, but we hope that one is a bit more of a step back and more engaged. So um, I'll just pass it off to Melanie for any other uh, final comments. And again, thank you all for, for being here. And, and again, please do stay in touch um, with ideas. Uh, a lot have always comes from all of you on the Zoom screen, so thank you. Um, I would just reiterate my thanks to all of you for participating in all of this work. Um, you know, I'll emphasize that more and more, I, you know, particularly as we go into the work in December and looking forward. Um, you know, we've got uh, now two years under our belts to look at what we've accomplished. We have more information to work from and a lot of opportunities ahead of us. Uh, so I'm excited to get back into the swing of starting to talk about another four-year plan just two years into this one because i think we've got a lot of new information to work from that we can apply to the next planning cycle so thank you all for your willingness to be put to work to help us accomplish all of these really important goals for the state and i hope you enjoy the next couple of months before we see you in december and I, can uh, i just say something please yes, i would like to say that please let's let's allow some time for partying uh, on December 1st, cocktail socialization perhaps, that's all. Great, thank you, Lydia. Always, I, I do think um, we're grateful for everyone's heavy lifting. I will just say, um, uh, Cassandra Rose, our, our um, Climate Council coordinator, who I'm very grateful she ran the slides and doesn't get enough thanks for all of her heavy lifting and hard work, reminded me we are gonna be especially engaging with state agencies and the working groups in the coming weeks and months to make sure that December 1 has a robust update of progress. So uh, look for us grilling you all on what's being done, because I think we're trying to track it all, but we can't keep all the pieces together all the time. And just you know, listening to Amanda Beal's report, for example, from one agency, there's just a ton happening. And uh, we want to make sure we deliver it all to you on December 1. So state agency folks especially be ready for some more questions from us in the next couple of months. So. Thank you, Cassie, and, and thank you, Lydia. And um, again, just another thanks, and, and um, we will see you all December 1, if not before. <laughs>